In the last episode on the history of ancient Canaan, we left off with the founding of Egypt's 18th dynasty by Pharaoh Ehmos I, who also rid his land of the Hyksos, whom he despised. The Hyksos though fled across the Sinai Desert and sought refuge among the strongly fortified cities of Canaan. However, Ehmos and the pharaohs that followed were not about to let the matter rest there. They not only pursued the remnants of the Hyksos deep into Canaan, but also launched annual military campaigns into the region. This was not just to punish the Hyksos, but the implementation of a new Egyptian foreign policy. The Hyksos had taught the Egyptians a valuable lesson. They were extremely vulnerable from the east. In order to ensure their security, they decided to build a protective buffer between themselves and Asia, as well as called the Shots in Canaan. This was different than the prior centuries where the two lands had lived side by side, influencing but never really occupying the other. Earlier Bronze Age Egyptian incursions into Canaan were generally short term, either for trade or the occasional quick raid against a few select Canaanite settlements. However, the pharaohs of the 18th dynasty and those that followed began a policy of not just long-term intervention in Canaan, but outright occupation of the land. Between 1550 to 1450 BCE, city after city in Canaan and the western Levant fell to the Egyptians. This though brought them into conflict with the other great powerhouse of the region, the Hurrian kingdom of the Mitanni. The Mitanni had claimed much of the same land to have been within their own sphere of influence. And so, they assembled a large force of Canaanite proxies to harass the Egyptians. In 1470 BCE, Pharaoh Thutmose III faced them at the Battle of Megiddo, where he was victorious. This victory not only cemented his new empire in Canaan, but allowed him to march almost unopposed to the banks of the Euphrates River in what's today northern Syria. There, he erected a monument to both commemorate his victory as well as mark his eastern border. Though holding such parts of northern Syria proved in the end to be unsustainable, the Egyptians were able to keep a firm grip over the cities of Canaan. Basically, the native princes of the region became their vassals, with Egyptian advisors sent to watch over them as well as to collect taxes. In return for their allegiance, the Canaanite cities were given Egyptian protection against all outside threats. While there was a loss of political independence, most of these cities actually benefited economically from Egyptian control, since both sides wanted to keep the lucrative trade between the two lands flowing without a hitch. Large quantities of Egyptian luxury items, such as ivory and glazed vessels, entered Canaan, while Canaanite wine, bronze tools, and textiles made their way into Egypt. Of course, due to their unchallenged rule of the area, the Egyptians were able to set the terms for any mercantile exchange, which obviously was set in their favor. We should remember though, that not all of what we identify today as Canaan was part of the Egyptian empire. Some cities, especially those in the north such as Ugarit, remained outside of Egyptian control. They were able to retain their independence for a while before coming under the influence of the Mitanni or Hittite empire. We should also remember that Egyptian control of Canaan was not easy. There were many problems with ruling a foreign territory and its diverse population whose local politics were often difficult to navigate. One glimpse into this world is through the so-called Amarna letters, a collection of at least 380 cuneiform tablets of diplomatic correspondence spanning the reigns of pharaohs Amenhotep III, Akhenaten, and the early years of Tutankhamun. They were discovered among the ruins of Akhenaten's capital city of Akhetaten, today the site of Tel el Amarna. Most of these were written in the Babylonian dialect of Akkadian, the international language of commerce and diplomacy at the time. Though several of these documents consist of letters from other great kings of the period, the vast majority of them are diplomatic correspondence between the pharaoh and his vassal princes in Canaan and the Levant. In them, these local Canaanite rulers discuss matters of state, local problems with various uncivilized tribes and bandits, requests for military aid, and the like. A lot of them are also complaints against the leaders of rival cities and territories. Here's an example of one such letter from a certain Abi Milku, the governor or mayor of Tyre. In it, 
Abimilku informs the pharaoh that he has set aside his ships, probably reluctantly, for Egyptian troops. For a mercantile, coastal city such as Tyre, its ships were its very lifeblood, not just for economic salvation, but also the city's protection. Though Abimilku has faithfully carried out the request, he also reminds the pharaoh of his promise to defend the city of Tyre should it be put in danger. To the king, my lord. Message of Abimilku, your servant. I fall at your feet seven times. What the king, my lord, ordered, I have done. The entire land is afraid of the troops of the king, my lord. I have had my men hold ships at the disposition of the troops of the king, my lord. Whoever disobeyed has no family, has nothing alive. Since I guard the city of my king, my lord, my safety is the king's responsibility. May he take cognizance of his servant who is on his side. Though not necessarily a weak ruler, Akhenaten was nevertheless devoted to the new religious movement that he founded, worship only of the god Aten. Spending most of his days in devotion to the god, his gaze was turned away from Egypt's empire in Canaan, and ultimately, Egyptian influence there began to wane. The final pharaoh of the 18th dynasty was Horemheb, who died in 1307 BCE. Lacking an heir, he appointed his vizier, Ramesses, to succeed him. This new pharaoh founded Egypt's 19th dynasty and became Ramesses I. Due to the Hittite threat, he, along with Seti I, set about to establish even firmer control of Canaan and Egypt's empire abroad. In addition to reigning in rebellious vassals and client kings, these pharaohs also sought to limit Hittite expansion into Syria. Though Seti I did manage to conclude a peace treaty with the Hittites, it ended up being short-lived. It was his son and successor, Ramesses II, who after facing the Hittite king Muwatali II at the famous Battle of Kadesh in 1289 BCE, who brought about a lasting peace treaty, though 16 years after that battle. With peace in the region, Ramesses II could focus his energies on the massive building projects that he's become so well known for. Under Ramesses II, a deliberate policy was started in Canaan where it went through a major strategic reorganization that clearly favored funding and building up of certain cities over others. There was no one-size-fits-all policy. The Egyptian government had a very targeted approach to dispersing its resources in Canaan, whereby only those cities and settlements that served some clear benefit to Egypt were invested in. This also meant that while certain cities were allowed to prosper, others were left to decline. This may have caused the displacement of many peoples in Canaan, who eventually moved to the hills to form small settlements there, away from the eyes of their Egyptian overlords. Archaeological evidence does show that during this time, there was a sharp increase in small village settlements and towns, perhaps also rebellions, by such people who the Egyptian government was clearly ignoring. One of these peoples may have been the Israelites. In a stele commissioned by Ramesses II's successor, Merneptah, the pharaoh names several peoples that he claims his armies had subdued. Towards the end of the stele, he states, Canaan is captive with all woe. Ashkelon is conquered. Gezer seized. Yanoam made non-existent. Israel is wasted, bare of seed. All who roamed have been subdued. The text comes from a monument that's become known as the Merneptah Stele, and it's the first time in history that we hear of a nation called Israel. It's also during Merneptah's reign that the first of many groups of pirates and marauders, known to us as the Sea Peoples, make their appearance. Though his forces are able to defeat them and their Libyan allies, the Sea Peoples would return in greater numbers a few years later in 1177 BCE during the reign of Ramesses III. He tells us that they were made up of a confederation of several peoples, among them the Peliset, Tejekar, Shekelesh, Danuna, and Washesh. Egyptian forces fought them in two battles, 
one on land in Canaan in what's today modern Lebanon, and another, more famous battle in the Nile Delta. Ramesses claims that he was victorious in both battles, and that he took many prisoners, several of whom were later pressed into military service to man the garrisons at Egyptian-controlled cities and outposts in Canaan. While the Sea Peoples may have been annihilated in the Delta, it would have been extremely difficult, if not impossible, for the Egyptians to have forced them to have left Canaan. The Sea People attacks had weakened Egypt to the point that it could no longer sustain its holdings there, and thus, the Egyptian government probably cut deals with several groups of the survivors to try to dissuade them from regrouping and launching future attacks. To do this, Ramesses III would have had to have given them both land as well as the conditions to allow their local economies to prosper, which ultimately would provide markets for Egyptian goods as well. Some of the Sea Peoples were given plots of land in Canaan as a way of ensuring their loyalty to the pharaoh. One of these, known as the Peliset, were given land just outside of Egypt and became vassals to the pharaoh. They're believed by many to have been the early Philistines that appear in the Hebrew Bible. The arrival of the Sea Peoples on the coast of Canaan around the year 1200 BCE has traditionally been accepted by most historians as the transition from the Late Bronze to the Iron Age. While weakened by those initial attacks, the Egyptians really didn't withdraw fully from Canaan until several decades later, around the year 1150 BCE. It's after this withdrawal that opportunities arose for those remaining to expand their presence and form their own independent kingdoms. These would include the Philistines, Israelites, and several other nations. Honestly, can't wait to get into that with you in another video. As always, thanks so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. If you learned something or simply just enjoyed the video, please don't hesitate to hit that like button because it helps the channel out a lot. Also, check out the History with Sai podcast where I go into more detail with regard to some of the topics discussed on the channel. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thanks again, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Take care and stay safe.